Hi, this is Neil with Rock Our World. I've been quite a while putting together this next project. I guess I'm. Uh, this is my third episode. The first one I talked about the what I feel is a revelation that the two witnesses are in fact the Bride of Christ, and the way that works is uh, the Bride is made up of thirty thousand Jewish people and a hundred and fourteen thousand. Christians. And if we back up the whole story, we got to understand who the two houses of Israel are. Everything God says in his word, in particular the prophets, his prophetic messages to the last day people, who are us, we are now in the last days, all of those messages are addressed to two groups of people, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And as I've gone over this many, many times, and it's important to prove this to yourself and get this really sound in your mind and heart, that God is an unchanging God. God doesn't lose track of people. God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't make a new plan because the old plan didn't work out. God is a God that had everything in place before he even created Adam and Eve. In fact, I'm going to say before he created the angels, he had the whole plan in place. He knew that a third of the angels would rebel. He knew that men were much more flawed than the angels and that they would all be rebellious. And he, in a sense, is reverse engineering what happened with the angels. They were created perfect and they, a third of them rebelled and men were created imperfect. And he's asking a few to turn from their rebellion to obedience, trust, not necessarily blind trust, but a trust that that leads us to do the things we don't even understand. When God says, I want you to do this and this and this, that we go ahead and do it out of obedience because we trust that God knows what he's doing. He's a trillion times smarter than we are. So, uh, these few people that choose to turn from rebellion to obedience, he is calling the first fruits, and he is particularly particularly focusing on the these last fifty years that we're in, and uh, the hundred years leading up to it. I covered aspects of that in the last two episodes, that the birth pangs of the Messiah appear to have been done two jubilee cycles before the final jubilee cycle and this is following the pattern that we find in the exodus so i guess i should rehearse how the lord challenged me to do this i feel he did anyway i had these five nights of prophetic dreams and i did not understand the meaning other than they were prophetic they were highly encrypted symbolism and and then i found out julie Wedby has had just released her latest message. This is going back a couple weeks that the Lord is now going to reveal things that he has had hidden up to this point. Remember what he said to Daniel? He said, write this down, Daniel. You're not going to understand. It will be those in the last days that come to understand. So here we are. We're in year uh, 5951. We've got 49 years to go. We're in the first year of the last Jubilee cycle of the six working days of man. So uh, I know I've got a lot of thought, thoughts on board here, but take a look at the Jubilee system. The Lord revealed this uh, to some extent in the Torah of Moses, the first five books of the, the what we call a Bible. It's really called the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. That is the word of God. So there's some revelation there of the Jubilee cycle system. And then there's uh, a full revelation in the book of Jubilees. And once you read those two books and study them somewhat, you will have a revelation of how God has set everything up in his plan in Jubilee cycles. He's a God of order. He's a God that pre-planned everything to the tiniest details that we can't 
even fathom he because he's a trillion times smarter than us and our quest is to come to understand so uh, like the scripture says it's the glory of God to hide a matter and the glory of a king a human being to find it out so we're our job is to press in on the Lord to search the scriptures to press in in prayer and fasting and and uh, full commitment to our Lord meditation all the things that bring about that closeness to our Lord and ask him what do these things mean and this, you're never you're never going to get there if we're never going to get there if we're busy not doing these things busy not reading the scriptures uh, this has been said a number of times how can you even begin to have an opinion about God if you've never read what he said most believers have never read the Torah the prophets and the writings and a few more have read bits and pieces and of the what's so-called New Testament which is not um, there, there's not new revelation in the in the how, how do we put this everything that God has set in place is found in the Torah the prophets and the writings all the apostolic writings can do is add to that revelation add to revelation that's already there there's no changes in the apostolic writings Paul did not have the authority to change something that God put in place and I've used this example many many times the the instruction to circumcise our male children on the eighth day which is an idiom for the new moon festival so we're instructed to circumcise our male children on the first new moon festival that occurs after that child is born that male child that has never changed Paul did not change circumcision in the book of Galatians, he was very upset with people who were teaching in Galatia that you had to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to do anything to be saved except turn your life over to Jesus Christ, to Yeshua, and accept his blood to cover your sins. You can't do anything to get rid of your past sins. God does that by applying the blood of, a, of the Lamb to our lives he redeems us he buys us back from death we can't do that so you don't get circumcised to get saved you don't get baptized to get saved you don't stop drinking alcohol to get saved you don't speak in tongues to get saved uh, the list could go on for thousands and thousands of points if you go to the 35,000 Christian churches and the 15,000 Jewish churches you will find 50,000 ways to get saved, but none of them match what God says. There's just the one way to get saved. Turn your life over to God, accept the blood of the Lamb as payment for your past sins, and I always add in our future mistakes because we will make mistakes. But you don't go ahead and keep sinning knowingly. It doesn't cover that. So you have to be very careful once you've made this commitment that you you lead a life of striving to overcome sin and sin is the transgression of the Torah so everything written in the Torah including circumcision eating pigs and other forbidden meats and so on uh, people have the most trouble with those two for whatever reason Uh, that includes those things. There's about 600 points of instruction within the Torah. God's asking us to obey him, all the points. And you'll find once you read through it that uh, roughly one to 200 points will apply to you. And when you find out somewhere down the road you're a Levite, you might have a few extras, or you will have a few extras. But you want to be aware of what the Levites had to do too. You don't be, uh, you be aware of, of uh, how you conduct yourself on the Sabbath day. You be aware of uh, touching dead things and 
touching things that are uh, have been made uh, unclean or the, what's the be better word for unclean and uh, translated from Hebrew to English? It's a, a temporary loss of freedom to enter the inner court and the Holy of Holies. So when you do things that make you unclean, you, di you um, dismiss yourself from being able to go into the Holy of Holies. And that's what we do when we pray. So if... I've used this example before, but if you have a piece of bacon every morning, you can't go into the inner court or the Holy of Holies until sunset. So if you do it every morning, you're barred, basically. You're barring yourself, not God's not barring you. You can go ahead and read these things and teach yourself these things. Uh, it takes effort. Now, that was a long rabbit trail here. So back to the starting point of this project, we're looking at what happens the first seven years of the tribulation, and they, we're already nine months into it. This is the last 50 years of all time. The, the, the 6,000 years that man, God has allotted to man, that all time. Now, as soon as that's complete, we start the thousand years, and then we have another 20 jubilee cycles. And we will keep everything perfectly, the way God commands us to keep it. He says, uh, within this Jubilee cycle, every seventh year, you rest the land. Farmers, you won't be farming on the seventh year. You forgive all debts. So debts cannot carry on forever and ever. They're canceled every seven years. There's no interest charged. Uh, sounds a little different from our banking system, doesn't it? And then every 50th year, all land returns to family ownership. So in other words, you can't buy and sell land. You can only lease it. If someone wants to let somebody else farm their land, make some kind of agreement with them, or they become poor, they can lease it to somebody else. But uh, at every 50th year, all that land returns to the family. So in other words, nobody can gather wealth. Uh, there's a redistribution of wealth by default. First of all, every seventh year, and then a really big redistribution every 50th year. And that is why we know that 1967 was the Jubilee year, because the city of Jerusalem, that land, was returned to both houses, not just the Jewish people. It was returned to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The Jewish people are the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah, and there are a liberal portion of the Levites amongst them. So that's why we say there's two and a half tribes there, and then uh, there would be ten and a half in the other group, but Dan is not included for whatever reason in the 144,000. That's how we end up with this uh, these numbers, 30,000 Jewish people and 114,000 Christians. And those are the two houses of Israel, and they are the two witnesses. The Jewish people witness that the Torah, the prophets, and the writings are legitimate. They are the words of God, and he never changes. And the, the Christian people are the witness that Yeshua, or Jesus, is our Savior, and that we can only be saved through him by his blood. So those are the two witnesses, and right now the Jewish people do not accept the Christians' witness, and the Christians do not accept the Jewish people's witness. We don't believe the word of God, Christians don't, and the Jews don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. So what we're gonna see as this unfolds is the two witnesses will be one. They will come into unity through a supernatural act of God. These, 100, these 144,000 will have a center of operation in Jerusalem. They are the first fruits. They are the bride, but they're in training for the first three and a half years. And they will be given the supernatural ability to, amongst many, many other things, uh, to travel. So that's how they can be. Uh, overseers of all the different areas of the of the earth. So the great work that God's going to do is going to happen 
uh, to a large part in this first three and a half years. We're going to see great darkness take over the earth, uh, literally and figuratively. We're going to very likely start the whole thing off with three days of darkness when planet X, we've been calling it, uh, brown dwarf star, covers the sun. Uh, orbits, as it's passing through our immediate solar system, it will eclipse the sun for three days and three nights and we'll have total darkness like just like you were down inside a a mine deep within the earth and there's no light sources it's completely pitch dark god's going to make it we won't even be able to see the stars for whatever reason anyway i know i'm getting lots of rabbit trails going here but I'm trying to pull a whole lot of things together i, I probably got 20 or 30 pages of notes and I really don't know where to start so I'm just going to start talking and take as many episodes as it takes step by step uh, so back to this uh, bride it appears and this is me speaking this is I feel what God has showed me that the two witnesses are the bride they are the two houses of Israel they come into supernatural unity each one accepts the other's revelation so they'll walk 100% unity with both the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and his blood covering their sins, and they will totally believe the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So the 600 or so separate instructions that are found within the Torah of Moses will be kept, and that's what God's looking for. He's looking for obedient people. Remember, I've said this a couple times, when Moses stood, uh, on the far side of the Jordan, he wasn't allowed to cross over into the Promised Land. Only Caleb and Joshua, amongst those 20 and over who left Egypt, qualified to pass over. That's not very many good hearts. And that's an illustration of our disobedience as human beings. We're going to do, we're going to do a little bit better on this second round, the final, the, the grand finale the last 50 years and of course that for last 40 years of wandering through the wilderness and the purpose is God is challenging challenging us to let go of our religious baggage and believe him finally believe him that we're supposed to follow all these instructions they have deep meaning God is a trillion times smarter than us he thought it all through and it is perfect information and when we as we obey more and more we'll get more and more revelation obedience and revelation come together disobedience and and uh blindness go together so back to what moses said when he stood there and he said okay people this is the way of life and blessings this is the way of death and curses that has never changed. The way to life and blessings is to follow the 600 points of instruction. The Jewish people say there's 613, and we've read a few uh, few listings, and they're, they are different from each other. So we won't argue how many exactly there are. You just read through them and do the ones that apply to you. If you're a farmer, you need to be keeping the land south. And I, I got a, a quote for you. Uh, read the last, in fact, you can do some homework. Read the last chapter of the book of Jubilees. It's chapter 50. It's divided into 50 chapters. Uh, the, the, the Exodus story happened on the 50th Jubilee. God does everything on time. And now this last Exodus is happening on the 120th Jubilee. And there were 70 in between. All those numbers mean something. I'm not going to say I know all the, the reasons, but uh, God is a God of order. He intended to do the have the exodus happen on the 50th year, 50th Jubilee, and he intends uh, this last exodus to occur during this final Jubilee of the six working days of man. Okay, back to Moses standing there. This is the way of life and blessings. Follow those 600 instructions. This is the way of death and curses. Don't follow those 600. Now, 
you're not going to know how to do all of them all at once. So that is just give yourself a break, but there's a starting point. Why don't, why don't you make it right now? I will explain the best I know how when the Sabbath day is. That's the very, if you read through all of the revelations of all these books, not only the Torah, the prophets and the writings, but they should include the book of Jubilees and the book of Jasher and the book of, of um, I'm missing one, Enoch. They're supposed to be there. Now they are. They've been restored. Read all of those. If you read them, you get the distinct impression the place you start is by keeping the Sabbath day. And I've explained this to you many, many times. The Sabbath day is a day that's pointed out by a sign from either the sun or the moon. That's Genesis 1.14. After you do a, a word study on the word 4150 in the Strong's Concordance, it means appointed time. And then move to Ezekiel 45.17 and you'll see that the appointed, the appointed times include the Sabbath day, the new moon festival, and the seven yearly festivals. Those nine appointed times contain the entire plan of God. If we obey them, if we observe them on their proper days, now we have the calendar, Enoch provided it for us, we will receive revelation. That's how God works. If we're going to be disobedient, we're not going to get revelation. And right now, neither Christians nor Jews are obedient. They don't keep any of the appointed times. And they don't, uh, the ones they think they're keeping, they're keeping them all on the wrong days because they're disobedient concerning the calendars. So that uh, being said means that Sunday is not the Sabbath and neither is Saturday. God does not use the Babylonian calendar to, to reveal his Sabbath days. So what it boils down to, to make a long story short, the Sabbath day is pointed out by the moon. The moon gives a distinct sign every seven days within its uh, 28 to 29 day cycle. And you keep the Sabbath on those four days. They're pointed out quite clearly. And then the moon takes a break for a day or two. It's never the same. Uh, the moon cycle is very erratic. God made it that way. You have to be watching to know if you got a one day or a two day new moon festival. And I've pointed this out many times. An example of a two day new moon festival is found in 1 Samuel 20. Read the whole chapter. The story there transpires over a two day new moon festival. Some days is, sometimes it's just one day. In fact, in the course of a, of a year of 12 and a third moon cycles, more or less, there will be approximately half and half, approximately six to seven one-day new moon festivals and six to seven two-day new, new, new moon festivals. The Jewish people are disobedient, that is the rabbis, by using a moon calendar to find the yearly festivals. God it makes it very clear in both Enoch and Jubilees that we're to be using the sun to find the months. There's only 12 of them, there's never 13, and they follow the sun, not the moon. Now, how far have I got? Not so far. So I'm gonna quickly go through a few things here. I'll come back and add details. I'll just do that many projects I've had. I'll do the intro here, well, this is the third intro. Come back and fill in pieces and Always read the commentary. Sometimes it takes me quite some time to make a commentary. And I will often fill a whole 75 lines up. So I put in lots of scriptures and lots of thoughts that I might have missed or explained better and so on. Okay. Uh, this is just some points. In studying these three counts of the Exodus story, one in the Torah of Moses, one in the book of Jasher, and one in the book of Jubilees. If you go to Jasher 73:37, you'll see this is what is reported. Moses feared the Lord, his God, all his life. And Moses walked before the Lord in truth with all of his heart and soul. He turned not from the right way all the days of his life. He, delivered, 
he declined not from the way either to the right or to the left, in which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had walked. In other words, Moses got really high marks in how he lived his life. He was a true uh, servant, and he was a true um, bearer of the of the covenant. Just like what I'm where I'm going with this is he was a type of Yeshua. In in this story, he uh, took on the role of the bridegroom. Now, listen to this next one. This is Jasher 78.8. And Zipporah walked in the ways of the daughters of Jacob. She was nothing short of the righteousness of Sarah, Rebekah, Rachel, and Leah. So, what we're establishing here is that Zipporah and Moses were very righteous people. They, they earned the highest marks possible with the Lord, and he... He orchestrated this because they're a type of the bridegroom and the bride. What happened in this story, uh, this first seven years that unfolds, and that's the point of what I'm doing, why I'm doing this project, at year three and a half, which is the same time frame that you see in Revelation 12, where the woman is protected for three and a half years, and then you see the same three and a half years in... Uh, uh, when it talks about the two witnesses that they're witnessing center of operations in Jerusalem for three, that same three and a half years. And this is me talking. We're talking about the same thing. The bride is the 144,000. They are the two witnesses. And they're in training up to this three and a half year point. So in this story of the first exodus, Zipporah and Moses were married at year three and a half. So that gives us an indication that the marriage comes after this three and a half year training period. That's when Yeshua marries his bride, who is uh, prophetically portrayed by Zipporah, this righteous person. And Yeshua himself is prophetically portrayed by Moses, this other righteous person. So uh, then we go to Zipporah. Uh, in Exodus 4, 25, Zipporah prophetically announced, You are truly a bridegroom of blood to me. You can read that in your, your scriptures. Zipporah had just, uh, well, you, you read the account. Uh, she made this prophetic proclamation to her husband. You are a bridegroom groom of blood to me. That was prophetic. These two uh, were this uh, prophetic picture of the bride and the groom at year three and a half. That's when they were married. And you have to, you get a lot of that information from the book of Jasher. Now, uh, next thing is that at year five, so right now we're at year one. So at year three and a half, we're going to have the, the marriage of the bridegroom to the, to the bride. She's been trained for three and a half years. Her training is already in place. It's in motion. We are at nine months in this whole process. We're in year one, about nine months. This is uh, July, the middle of July 16th. And the bride has already been chosen. The people who are the bride may not know yet who they are, but they're getting knowledge and information and heads up. Uh, read all of Julie's messages, let's say the last five to ten messages. She's been getting more and more information on how this is coming about. Uh, the Lord is doing the final training for the bride. They're already picked, and they are becoming aware of what their jobs are, and they will eventually learn to move around the earth uh, supernaturally. So that's how they can be in Jerusalem, and then they can look after their assigned areas at the same time. And this this whole thing is starting, well, it started nine months ago, but it's in motion. Now, let's go to year five. So and we're talking four years from now. The new Pharaoh takes over. He's the Antichrist. This is me again talking. He He's the one that implements the beast system. 
So that's what we're looking for in year five. Uh, and this is looking through a glass darkly. This matches the new pharaoh, the evil pharaoh that came on the scene. Uh, the, the one before him was his father, in fact, and he was very evil, but this last one was the most evil. And you get the most account of, of what these two pharaohs did in the book of Jasher again. But uh, quite a bit in the book of Jubilees and, uh, and, you know, a reasonable amount in the book of Exodus. But most people only are aware of the Exodus story. So you need all three accounts to get all this information. So we're talking five years, four years from now, we will have the world government in place. And that will include the Mark of the Beast, which uh, every indication is showing us that is the implanted chip. It's already being experimented with in many countries, and people are voluntarily taking it. And the Lord is telling us all, do not take that mark under any circumstances. And you may very well have to die to become a martyr to avoid that. And uh, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. That means your work is over because you will be immediately in paradise and receive your reward. Uh, the knowledge of your reward, let's put it that way. But that means that you're not amongst the bride. Uh, you've missed out on that high level of reward. So we're talking about the year 5955 by this point, five years into the, the Great Tribulation. What can we expect in between? Uh, the prophets are telling us that we're going to start seeing earthquakes here very, very soon. We're in the middle of a, a very bad year here in North America, and I, I dare say the crops have been on the poor side worldwide. I know Australia's had a couple of bad years. And uh, South America has been having a lot of frosts in their growing season. And um, last I knew, the corn plant was very poor in the States. And the soybean plant, very poor. We have a good crop uh, growing right here. We are, but we're a tiny, tiny portion of the grow grain growing, food growing area of the entire world. And uh, we're having a very unsettled summer with lots of storms, lots of tornadoes, lots of vicious, we've been calling them plow winds for a number of years now. There's just more and more and more of them all the time. The weather is becoming more unstable, more erratic. And when we're talking growing grain in Saskatchewan, uh, there's a lot of enemies. There's We, we got about 10 days uh, uh, to spare on either side of the growing season, where frost can hit us, bad weather, lots of hail, lots of uh, intense storms, too much rain, not enough rain. Farmers have seen all these things over the years, but we're right on the edge of being able to grow a crop. And if the weather changes even a few degrees, uh, we have great crop losses. Now, before I end, and I'm over time, almost. I try and shoot for 30 minutes max, but if you want to do some homework, look up Alois, A-L-O-I-S, Earl Mayer. I may have pronounced them very poorly. Alois Earl Mayer, and that's I-R-L-M-A-I-E-R. -E he was a prophetic, he was a prophet, died the best I know you can look him up in the 50s 1950s and I've already pointed you toward Senior Van Rensburg he was a prophet at the turn of the century when the Lord sent seven eagles to our farm he gave us the instructions it's time to gather the prophets and I'm seeing this is one of the projects is to go back to the prophetic people that saw things for our future which is now both these men that I've mentioned have had visions of World War III. And I've also pointed it towards 10-year-old Jeremiah many times. You can find him on the internet. You can find all these guys on the internet and do some studying what they saw as part of World War III. So these are the things, going back to the first seven years in the story of the Exodus, just take all three of these counts, what happened starting 100 years ago, two ju Jubilee cycles back, 
tr the trouble started to increase and they have increased uh, every basically every year every decade got worse and worse and worse and worse and uh, at the turn of this last jubilee um, I'm going to say it it took a upward spike that the troubles are intensifying dramatically the prophets are telling us the earthquakes are going to start we're going to see fire from the east i suspect that could mean uh, the prophetic announcement uh, we've heard of new york being destroyed but the all the cities of the states are going to be destroyed and uh, if you listen to all those youtubes i point you towards uh, vancouver's on the hit list and again these prophetic people i can't verify they're 100% accurate or not, but the warnings are very intense and lots of them. So I am encouraging everyone to pay attention to those 10 or so prophets I've pointed you towards. And I will carry on with this project for as many uh, episodes as it takes. Uh, this is Neil signing out.